Um, We'll just give everybody a few minutes to get logged on. So are you working primarily from home then? Yeah. You know, it's a it's a tricky wicket, right? Because I don't do a ton of work. We have some clients in Colorado that I work directly with, but for the most part, my team is everywhere from you know Canada to Mexico. Our clients or wherever they are, we're always working APAC hours and EU stuff. So honestly, it's been really hard to get away from the desk. And like, this is gonna sound like an annoying problem to have, but like eight o'clock, it's like, go, <laughs> sprint. <laughs> yeah, there's not a lot of easing into the workday, I find at home. It's, it's just kind of, you, you just go. <laughs> you have kids? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it, it's just ready to go. And then you're on. Mm -hmm. Best and worst thing ever happened to me. <laughs> that is they're five weird. and seven, so we're we're out of that tunnel, and like they're super um, responsive and so much fun, and just yeah, they they don't like burn down days like they used to. So they're it's been a really fun like six or seven months. That's awesome. Yeah. Those are really fun ages. Really, really fun. All right, well, we are just a minute past the top of the hour. And so we are gonna get ready to get started. Um, looks like we've got some attendees already coming in. So, um, so with that, then um, good afternoon. And thank you for joining the very first installment of our cybersecurity awareness series. The purpose of this series is to break down some of the more basic cybersecurity principles and practices to local government staff and leaders in a way that's accessible, time conscious, because we know we're all busy, and hopefully helps to build a stronger culture of cybersecurity across organizations uh, throughout Colorado and our, and our growing region, um, regional connections as well. So we've all been there, right? Where we have to watch an hour long video and answer some questions about cyber safe practices, not knocking those trainings at all by any means, but cybersecurity requires a lot more than just a one and done training. We need to build a culture of learning around cybersecurity that helps us understand more regularly how what we do could be strengthening or potentially even weakening our organization's cyber defenses. And if anybody's been watching the news for the past 12 hours, this has definitely uh, moved from a, a critical level to a hypercritical level. So before we dive into today's discussion on asset management, I wanted to just offer some quick background uh, my name is Maddie Gullickson. I'm a program director at the National Cybersecurity Center. We're a nonprofit based here in Colorado with the focus of driving more cyber awareness and education. I help lead a program of the NCC called the Colorado Cyber Resource Center. The Colorado Cyber Resource Center is a, is a joint project of local CISOs and ITs, professionals working with the NCC to create a one-stop shop for local governments in Colorado for cyber resources and support. You can learn more at our website at colorado-crc.com. And some quick housekeeping real quick. We are recording this and it will be shared on our YouTube channel. Additionally, if you have questions during the discussion, feel free to add them into the chat and we'll address them at the end. All right, so today we are excited to talk about asset management, which may not sound exciting at first, but it's the most fundamental building block of cybersecurity. Because after all, if we, you can't protect what you don't know you have. To walk us through this, we're grateful to have Sean Tufts, Optiv's Practice Director of Product Security. Sean has extensive experience in supporting security solutions to complex organizations like energy providers. And you may recognize his name because when he hasn't been tackling security, he served as linebacker for the North Carolina Panthers. But we won't hold that against him. With that, Sean, thank you again so much for being here and go ahead and take it away. I'm sorry, I'm a Broncos fan, so that's why I just have to say. Uh, I see. The, uh, the boundaries of sport, no, they, they don't care about cybersecurity. Uh, um, yeah, so my name is Sean Tufts, uh, practice director here at Optiv. Um, I got brought in, and you can see my screen okay, right? It looks great. Good. So I'm here to speak to you today because in my practice with IoT devices, we are working towards finding the hardest assets to find, the things that are untraditional. Um, 
And, and there's really good corollaries there between understanding what your, your digital asset inventory is, how to get those in the hardest environments and what some of the baseline expectations are for an IT practitioner, sure, a cybersecurity expert, yeah, but then also the general population and how we can help those um, two other stakeholder groups really be better at this hard topic. Um, I've titled this Needles and a Stack of Needles. Um, all too often in an emergency situation where you're, there's a cyber attack or something crazy happening and you've got to go through and pour through logs and, and understand really massive amounts of data, it's really hard to determine what's you know, valuable and what's not. And that's really true in asset inventory. Um, we did a little bit on my background. I've spent most of my career in um, either oil and gas or power markets. Um, built a couple wind farms back in the day, served a, a five-year stint through General Electric, and we were really tackling some of those hard challenges head on. Um, if you can imagine the, the footprint of a General Electric on how many devices they have sold, purchased from refrigerators to jet engines, trying to find each one of those things, regardless of their digital footprint, is a, a, a global challenge. And when you overlay security vulnerabilities on that, it becomes a little bit more um, Sorry, a little bit more is a misleading, a lot more complex. So what we're gonna walk through today is a little bit of observations on the IT market and what kind of has been happening in the last couple of years. Number one, we've got an aging infrastructure. And I mean that, yes, in terms of roads and bridges and tunnels and things like that, but also a lot of our digital assets. Um, there's something like 25% of the, the Windows operating systems are Windows uh, 98 or older those things still exist out in the wild and they're still used to run systems. Um, and we have old legacy software platforms that are still up and running. A lot of you know, older, older SAP and Oracle databases that are still running and no one's gonna touch them. So from an asset inventory perspective, we have a lot of aged things out there, things being a technical word. We also have limited staff attention. So IT departments are under a lot of pressure. They have to do more with less, um, especially through COVID. It's been a real challenge to get the right number of people to be able to solve this problem and, and to be able to, to grasp it. A constantly changing environment as well. Um, these things are always evolving. They are rapidly um, downloading a, an AWS cluster, killing that, starting an Azure piece, migrating to Google. All these workloads are moving at a pace that, that no one thought possible even as near as 10 years ago. Overlay that with increased regulation. Um, there's been a lot of pressure on governmental entities, regulating bodies, um, even groups like NIST or private entities like SAND to really grasp asset inventory. Um, as Maddie said when she introduced us, you cannot protect from a cybersecurity lens what you don't know you have. So. If there's a, a big vulnerability happening or a ransomware strike or you know, something mundane like a, a, a bad password, it's really hard to step in from a security practitioner perspective and actually help solve that problem if you don't know the medium in which you're working with. Um, we talked about my football background a little bit earlier, right? How could Tom Brady expect to win a game when he don't know what, doesn't know what stadium he's playing in? And that's why asset inventory is so important. We can't fight and protect our systems if we don't know what's there. This is proliferating across all environments, right? We've got a cloud environment, we've got headquarters, remote offices, schools, airports, water facilities, power plants. And in the state agencies, in local small governments, in individual wastewater treatment plants, if those are standalone, it's really, really hard to kind of put all those pieces and parts together to really get a cohesion footprint especially when you've got software that's always moving. I talked about AWS, Google, and being able to slide through cloud environments almost seamlessly without any de data degradation. And then also from a hardware perspective, I used the General Electric example earlier. Um, if, if you don't know what hardware is out there, how can you solve it? And yeah, that's true for a jet engine, but it's also true for a router, for a switch, for a database, for an IP camera or a smart bridge, some of those harder things to find. Two examples of this, I'm gonna walk through software first. Um, these are headlines that you might've seen come across your ticker in the last year, um, SolarWinds and Log4j. SolarWinds is a company. Uh, SolarWinds is a great IT vendor. They had a, a vulnerability in their system. Now, that was a problem because you know, they had to fix it. 
But it was a bigger problem because SolarWinds is used in almost every Fortune 500 company. It's used in every single branch of the government. Uh, it's got like a 98% permutation rate into the market of all IT. It's used to tell if a network's up or down. In the baseline terms, their whole company is network diagnostics and making sure that things are working. And they had a big vulnerability. And it took every company in the country, every government agency, a long time to go find out how exposed they were to that because they didn't know they had this software. It was kind of something that was done and forgotten about and was a, a tool used in the background, but also turned into a very large backdoor to almost every enterprise. Security organizations had a really hard time finding SolarWinds products in their own environment. And that's why asset inventory is so important. The other headline you might've seen is Log4j. This one's been relatively recent. They don't try to publish the term Log4j as a vulnerability um, because it's not a company. It's not a thing. It's not someone you can point at. It's actually a process that happens inside of a server. Um, you generate logs and that log is a, a digital record of, some, of an event happening, an email being sent, a website being accessed, and it populates itself inside of a server. It had a critical vulnerability as well. This one was even harder to find because it was, you couldn't Google and find a company titled Log4j, that wasn't a thing. You actually had to go search and inventory every single piece of software and understand if it was using this database protocol. And that was a very big problem and orders of magnitude harder than we were dealing with SolarWinds. IT firms are really struggling because those two instances are big open back doors into many parts of our government agencies, our private sector, our critical infrastructure, and finding how to close those loops is a big challenge, especially when something um, gets blown open to the world and you've got to cram about six months of research into about three and a half days. And that's what our IT firms are faced with. Those are two examples that have really pushed legislators, have really pushed regulators to want to do more around software asset inventory. What does that mean for us? Um, you're going to hear this term SBOM in the Wall Street Journal and the uh, Denver Post and the LA Times. It's a software bill of materials. What this is saying is that gone are the days where we could look at a software bill of materials as an Excel spreadsheet, something we tracked unofficially. Um, that was the past. We need to be better at that. Um, and what we're moving into is that really complicated diagram on the right that we actually got from uh, NTIA. They, the software life cycle is important. So take the most basic building block, a Windows operating system, um, PowerPoint, right? We have to know everything that goes into that Windows machine, into the build of that Windows machine, into the software that's running it. You have to understand the hierarchical impact and what pieces and parts make up Windows. Things like Log4j, things like SolarWinds. And then you have to track those as they're in your environment. It's a really complicated process to do that. Um, I, I don't know how many third-party vendors or separate operating system components go into Windows, but it's probably measured in the hundreds, if not thousands. So keeping track of those things from a full life cycle, I'm not going to walk you through that life cycle, but the build phase, the testing phase, the release phase, the actual maintenance phase, how you're procuring all these things is the new norm and will be something that gets a lot more pressure on it in the future. There's a lot of information being written today about this topic. Um, CISA has probably the best program that I've seen. It's highly topical. Um, at the end of 2021, they did a, a two webinars. Um, they're both accessible on their website. We can drop that into the link here. Um, if you Google says a S bomb um, it was really playful and designed for an IT mindset, definitely, but it's going to walk through some of the details on how we get from that spreadsheet idea into something that's much, much more um, heavy and trackable and accountable. So that's out there on their website. Um, and we can drop a, a link to that in this recording as well. This leads me to the why question. What, what does this impact does this have on a teacher, on a, an administrator at the state? How do we as humans that interface with these IT systems help? 
I showed you how some of the vulnerabilities that can open are really hard to track. So the first thing we can do is really patch and migrate when asked. Um, my mother, bless her heart, she's still using a, an iPhone 4. And she, she is hell-bent on sticking with that iPhone 4. She likes to push the button and make sure it registers her fingerprint. And there's not a lot I can do to migrate her into something else. Um, we have people in our corporate environments, in our private sectors, our public sectors, that have that same mentality. Um, everybody's seen the person walking around the office who's like, 10 pound laptop is starting to bulge because the battery is expanding. Yeah, that's a problem. And you might lose a lot of data because of that. But also it, it represents a security risk. It, keeping those older systems updated is a real challenge. So when people ask you to patch something, when your, your machine starts to slowly shut down on you and restart because it has to apply a new patch to it, know that's there to protect you. Know that's a good process for our world. Um, and then migration, right? When someone asks for your laptop or your phone or replaces your desk phone, whatever it is, help them, right? That's all there to keep us safe, not just to annoy us. The other big thing you can do is help to pull down software from approved markets. Everybody's got a place where you can go legally um, and, and rightfully download um, uh, Visio or Windows or whatever you want from that internal company store. Use those methods. Um, Please don't buy software from, you know, the Ebays of the world, the Yahoo's of the world, the AWS's of the world, right? Those are bad places to be sourcing that stuff. Even if you go direct to a, a reliable company like a Microsoft or something like that, there might be reasons why that is an inappropriate IT build or software tool in your organization. So make sure you're vetting that. If there's something that you want that's not supported by your business, ask them, hey, can I have this? Is this worth whatever? Um, do we have any um, constraints on using this software? Again, that's there to protect you, not to be in the way of business. The last item, and this one's actually a question, do we need Bluetooth everywhere? Um, this falls directly into my work. There's just inappropriate uses of technology. Um, my sprinkler system, I should be able to operate it from my phone from somewhere else. Well, can I shut it down? Right? Do I know if it's operating? If it's rainy, can I shut it down as well? If it's leaking and sprouting water into the field, is that a feature I need? Maybe, maybe not. I think that's kind of applicable. A digital door lock? Maybe not. Maybe that security isn't that good. If someone can just walk up and interface with it and doesn't need a physical key, they can use some cool hacking tools. Is that an appropriate use of technology? So just finding those tones for your own personal use, for your business's use, use. We don't need everything turned on all the time. All right, transitioning into hardware. And this is where I live um, on a day-to-day -day basis. We work with critical infrastructure companies, pipelines, power plants, all those kind of fun stuff to make sure that those assets are safe. Historically, they've never been connected to the internet and we haven't needed to access a coal plant. Well, today we can and we should, and we should be getting data out of there and we should be controlling them. That's an appropriate use of technology, but we got a lot of really old stuff in there. So we got to make sure it's protected well. The two things that have really driven um, asset inventory have been COVID. People are going to write volumes of books about COVID, um, but its impact on critical infrastructure was very severe. And then obviously Colonial Pipeline. Um, Colonial Pipeline made news last year when they had a ransomware attack that shut down operations for a major East Coast pipeline. COVID, the reason it affected this hardware asset inventory piece was because it really stressed supply chain. Um, we've got clients that work in distribution centers. They have miles and miles, hundreds of miles of conveyor belts that move packages from A to B. Well, their throughput went 4X up at the start of COVID and they haven't been able to slow that process down. Um, other vendors are having trouble even getting components and parts. So they're forced to keep old, um, digital assets copied with old bad technology. Um, and it's really strained that system. Furthermore, more people are utilizing these assets from places they didn't used to. Um, you can now control things from your couch that you weren't able to access before. So COVID put a lot of stress on the system, specifically around hardware. And then Colonial happened. And that was a big inflection point. Um, what we saw there was hackers and nation states and hoodies and, and bad actors really focusing and hitting kind of below the belt. They're really focused on new places. Um, 
And I remember I, everyone will have burned in their head the, the people filling trash bags up full of gas, you know, putting them on their, I saw one guy with a backpack on a motorcycle full of gas. Um, that hardware component has a new threat actor. And there are people who are targeting those kind of um, critical infrastructure facilities. We saw this all over the news, right? This was very, this has been kind of in our face for the last two and a half years. From a cybersecurity perspective, this all leads with asset inventory. Again, you can't protect what you don't know is there. If Colonial didn't know where their pipelines were, it'd be really hard to walk up to them and safely shut them down. Um, same thing with that conveyor belt company or the distribution center that was using conveyor belts. It's really hard to walk in there and adequately safely operate and restore production in case something bad happens if you don't know what's there. A lot of our critical infrastructure right now is blind as well. We don't have a lot of great telemetry from a security perspective in those environments. How's this relevant to you guys? Physical is to cyber. We have new attacks coming. Um, physical security and cybersecurity are starting to blend together. The way you walk up to a door and interface with it, there's a cybersecurity component to that. Cybersecurity threat actors, they're taking on a physical component as well. Um, that's looked like um, a couple guys in California with AK-47s shooting a substation. That's looked like a couple years ago in the Ukraine, um, somebody came up with a chainsaw and cut the power lines going into a, 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 a substation as well. We're starting to see more of a physical presence there. Um, there's been hacks recently where people have been on site plugging equipment in that they shouldn't. Um, and that's a new vector for us to really have to control from a hardware perspective. This is the easy stuff from an asset inventory perspective. For the most part, everyone that has a laptop, you can probably turn it upside down. It's gonna say your company's name. You'll have a digital tag on there to tell you what that device is, all that kind of cool fun stuff. Same thing with our data centers, same thing with assets in the cloud. We're pretty good at finding those physical components and where they actually live and what they look like if you can walk up and touch it. These pieces are really, really hard. Um, inside a medical environment, moving right to left, hospitals do a really good job of tracking like number of band-aids, you know, or, I guess pints of saline, that kind of stuff. They're really bad at tracking the hardware though. Um, they know they've got X, you know, 10 MRI, MRI machines at the hospital around the corner, but I don't think, and I know this for a fact actually, they can't really tell what kind of MRI machine that is unless they go look at a, a physical spreadsheet or a, a clipboard in some cases. They've got to do a lot of research to find out if that's a Siemens machine or a GE machine. That's a challenge. And we don't have those digital tools today. The, the IoT device in the middle there, that smart fridge, IoT gets a lot of bad rap for smart fridges and Alexas and Pelotons and things like that. I'd rather position there as a security camera. Um, and I can't remember the corner of your office. You don't think a lot about it, but it could be made by Huawei. It could have spyware on it. It could be easily pirated and people stream video out. And that has happened. That last thing there, and most people don't know what that device is. You can see it has a Siemens logo on it. That's called a PLC, a Programmable Logic Controller. That piece of digital equipment is the dumbest piece of compute we have in the entire world. Um, it knows hotter, colder, faster, slower. That's it. It changes the physical world. This device is responsible for all the electricity in your socket. It's responsible for the food on your table, the gas in your tank. Anything that moves is probably done so by a little device like that. Historically, we've just kept the internet away and it was unhackable because there was no way to hack it. Well, now we're starting to make these internet enabled. We're starting to put Wi-Fi in these networks. We're starting to try to get more connectivity there and that's creating a really big um, security vector for us. A case study of that exact um, use case. Uh, two years ago now, the Super Bowl was in Tampa Bay. Tom Brady won, won the game out there. There's a little town about 10 miles from, from that stadium called Old Smar, Florida. It's about 15,000 people. Um, it's a small little rural town. It's a retirement village. There's a, a little business park there. They have about 10 square miles of uh, community. They own their own water system. They have one water treatment plant that's the cities to own and run. Well, the day before, the Friday before Super Bowl Sunday, so three days before one of the biggest sporting events in the world, 
someone secured remote access to that system from the outside. We don't know where. The system wasn't um, robust enough to understand who was interfacing with it. We couldn't get any log data. We didn't know where they were coming from. Someone had left a remote desktop session open. Inside that water treatment facility, the threat actor studied the environment. This is um, a hypothesis, but they looked at the processes. They looked at what they could interface with. They got a lot of recon. They, they decided what they could and could not do. It takes two kinds of minds to hack a system like this. The first one is you have to be a hacker and understand how to access one of these systems. The second one is you have to know enough about the facility you're interfacing with to do something. In this case, the water treatment plant used lye. Um, if you remember Fight Club, lye is the chemical that you, you can get a chemical burn if you interface it, skin and water. They use that in Fight Club to burn their hands for all our Fight Club fans out there. Normally, it's about 100 parts per million inside your water treatment facilities. They ramp that up to 11,100 parts per million. Uh, it's definitely could be titled a fatal dose. Certainly not something you want to be ingesting. Certainly not something you want the entire town of Tampa to be ingesting you know, two days before the Super Bowl. What saved this was a good-hearted employee. He was doing his job. He probably did not know that he was preventing a semi-lethal hack. He probably saw the red button go up on his thing and said, oh, that's bad, and dumbed it back down. He probably stepped into a cyber event and didn't even know he did it, um, which is cool. And we pay good people to do hard jobs. But if he would have been at lunch or uh, you know, watching Netflix, which happens um, from these facilities, it would have been a problem. This treatment plant looks like this. You guys drive past these every single day. Um, the reason we know this was the water treatment plant um, is because, well, number one, it was publicized, but number two, it, the way the threat actor likely got intelligence, I'm, I'm hypothesizing here, um, was because someone published too much information. The group that built this facility, it's largely automated. It's probably 10 to 15 years old based on the you know, Google research. Um, it's, it's lightly staffed. There's probably three or four people in this facility at any given time. <laughs> And this is the interface in which that good heart operator lives his life. He controls water from this thing. It's probably a, a touch screen or has a mouse and he can click on feed pumps and water pumps and cool fun stuff and change the conditions, add ingredients. You can see on the bottom left there, there's a, a mark that says NOAH pumps. That's lie. That's the pump that was interfaced with here. You can see from the screen in the bottom right corner, there's also a time and date. This has a date stamp of 2018, this image. It also on the bottom left corner has a physical address and a logo. What the security community has kind of come to realize is that there was a, a engineering firm and I've kind of blocked out their title. It, it, it's not our business to, to kind of shame them here, but they're really proud of this work. They took a screenshot of that interface and posted it on their website for everyone to see. Someone with bad intentions dragged this down. They looked at the address. They looked at the conditions. They studied the plant for largely two years, two and a half years before they made their cybersecurity play, their, their threat um, act. This was an example of some really simple stuff being publicized that didn't need to, that likely gave people more information and intelligence to hack a facility. Really scary stuff. So why is this important? Um, be careful what you share, right? That engineering firm was just trying to show a cool project they did for a cool city and a cool state. Um, they built a water treatment plant. They wanted to show off their wares and show how good they were at that, but they gave away a little too much data. That occurs to you guys every single day when you're leaving a state house, when you're exiting your kid's school. You know, information doesn't need to be shared all the time. So watch what, watch what you release to the public. That's true on Facebook, on LinkedIn. That's true when you're leaving facilities. Um, that's true when you post stuff. So just be careful what you share. The next piece is you are valuable. And you know my mom says that a lot, that I'm valuable and I appreciate it. But that's also true from a, a threat intel perspective. A credit card with a, a CCB score or CCB code, that has a dollar on the black market. So does your email address. So does your phone number. So does where you work. All these things are valuable for people that want to do bad things in these environments with these tools. The last piece here, especially on the hardware, if you see something, say something. Um, that's kind of a, a, a trait, or at least it's kind of becoming one of those terms that is said so often it loses its meaning. 
again, the only reason the Super Bowl's water supply wasn't hacked is because a good-hearted employee saw something and did the right thing. That should be true when people are entering your facilities. That tr should be true of your coworkers. If you see someone that you don't recognize, ask. It doesn't take much. We have an attack and pen group, um, attack and penetration group, which is when we go on behalf of the company to test these things. We show up on site where we shouldn't be. More often than not, the reason we fail at those is because someone is asked a question, who are you, why are you here? Can I see your credentials? Hey, do you mind? I wanna open this door for you, but if you could just show me your badge, I'd appreciate it. Those kind of activities is how you keep us safe. So back to the top here, and this is kind of my, my wrap up slide. When we're looking for a needle and a stack of needles, number one, software is moving so fast, it's really hard to keep that in check. It's really hard to know what we have. You can, from your seat today, you have a laptop, you can help those people be more, um, uh, have better data at their fingertips. From a hardware perspective, we interface every day with things that have a, a, a cybersecurity vulnerability to them. We interface every single day with hardware, servers, routers, switches, laptops, IoT cameras, smart fridges. Um, those things are hard to find. Let's not make it harder. All of these combine into a really difficult cybersecurity environment because you can't secure what you can't see. And that needle in the haystack that you're holding might just be tied to a whole bunch of ransomware sitting behind you that you have no idea. So just be careful with your equipment. Um, from an asset inventory perspective, you're gonna start seeing a lot more pressure put on IT systems to know what you've got. You're gonna start seeing a lot more pressure from local agencies to understand what, what physical devices you have. Those things are there to protect us. So please be nice to your IT staff. They're just, they have a hard job. <laughs> um, we see that every day and let's not make it harder for them. So from an observation perspective, bringing this back to the first slide we had, from an aged infrastructure, you can help to migrate these systems. You can help to be that beacon to show people what we're doing, what you're, what you're working with. Hey, this thing needs to be replaced. From a li limited staff intention, as I said before, just communicate. Um, and be nice to IT people. They're just there to do their job. From a constantly changing environment, you can help. You can be that agent of change as well. Um, knowing what you put in the cloud, knowing what you put in your personal G drive, um, knowing what you email to yourself, those are things that you know you shouldn't be doing. And finding a way, IT staff should be tasked with finding an easy way for you to do the right thing. And you can be an agent of help there. As far as increased regulation, you know, not a lot you can do from, from your seat, but just understand those pressures. Um, and that's the biggest thing is understand where people are coming from, why they want you to go to a, a known marketplace, why they want you to not email things to yourself. Um, those are all parts that keep us safe. And if I can leave you guys with anything, I, I do wanna make sure, um, make sure to impart on you that cybersecurity is everybody's job. Whether you're the good hearted employee operating a waste treatment plant in Tampa, or you're the chief information security officer. All parts in between have a role to play in keeping us cyber secure. Um, asset inventory is one of the initial points that's going to get a lot of attention. Um, and it's a place we can all help with. Thank you very much for your time today. And, and um, yeah, please help us keep everybody secure. Thank you, Sean. And I, th I think that's such a, a good point that this is all of our responsibility. Um, so to, to come back to that question of, and, and even thinking a little bit of that one slide with the, with the flash point of the Excel spreadsheet, what would you recommend to a, a small organization that is operating on a shoestring budget? Um, how would you recommend that they start this process, both on the software side and on the hardware side? Um, in a way that might be manageable to a small staff and, and without a lot of capacity for, for tracking that? I'd say from a top-down approach, um, the full embodiment of that SBOM software bill of materials, tracking all pieces and parts, I think there's a fairly um, healthy respect for the ability for organizations to do that. Number one, having, when I say start from the top-down, Having a more robust procurement strategy and how you interface with the people you interface with. And when you do buy new assets and new cloud programs and new software stacks, you can ask some easy questions in there and, and be more responsive um, 
And that's an easy way to do that. It doesn't take a lot of lift to ask a couple of additional questions in a, a RFP phase or you know, when you're going online and clicking through, you can ask those questions at those points. From the top-down perspective, get a handle on your big blocks, your operating systems, your servers, your those kind of things, and understand what vendors are operating underneath from a, a, a vendor perspective, right? That way, if you do find a solar wind style thing, it's not as hard to go do some research there. Um, I think in a lot of ways, that's still going to be done manually and long, arduous processes, but having that um, having that inventory from a top-down perspective is still the best starting point. And I think on that question too, of the length of time, do you have um, an idea or a recommendation of how long this kind of should take if you're a, again, kind of maybe a smaller organization with, um, I don't know, say 50 to 100 employees or you know, even under, even under 500, um, what, what's a, what's a good, uh, what's a good barometer for people to be thinking about how long this should take? I think to set up a program and to get some of the, the initial foundations out there, you know, probably a, a two month period where you're kind of developing norms, talking to your stakeholders, you know, starting to build that inventory perspective. And then from there, there's kind of an ongoing maintenance. It's always going to have to be in play. Um, putting those right policies and procedures in place for how you track when you ship out a laptop, how you track when you buy a new uh, a camera system or badge reader, all that should be funneled back to one location. So as long as you can get good buy-in in that first three months tranche where you're really sprinting to get all that under control and placing the, the ease of use components out there, then the maintenance should be less. How, how often would you recommend folks um go back and revisit their, their inventory in that more holistic, uh, larger scale process? You know, I don't have any good advice there. Um, how often is a, 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 is a rate of change question, right? Are you a, an organization that has constant churn or are you an organization that is fairly static, right? And that'll kind of lead you to that right answer. So if you're a, a a STEM school and you're always burning through new cool stuff and you're always bringing new devices in, you're always buying new stuff from Amazon, you're always buying new web services, you know, that, that means you have to have a higher rate. Um, if you're a water treatment plant that's nothing changed since 1985, then that's easier, right? So that, that's highly dependent on, on your own rate of change. Okay. How, um, for, for those who might be those agents of change in their organizations trying to get some kind of basic inventory started or or taking the time to maybe go back over uh, an inventory that was started a few years ago but never really finished how would you recommend uh, people message the importance of doing this and um and 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 trying to get that buy-in from other agencies because i'll i'll be honest even just on the the very basic thing of when your computer does shut down in the middle and it starts to patch, like I get frustrated, um, and I know how important this is. So, um, so how would you how would you recommend people start to message that? And it did happen to me this week. I was presenting in front of a a, a client of ours, and my machine shut down, and I had to quickly hang up and dial it on my phone. So it does happen. Um, I'd say recommendations. <clears throat> I think highlighting to organizations that you wanna shrink the attack surface for everyone's benefit, right? That's an easy thing to say, a hard thing to, to communicate successfully. But I think saying, hey, we gotta firm up our, our boundaries, our, our digital edge, if you will. And we don't know some of the things that are out there and we wanna tighten that up to keep everybody safe and be more efficient, right? So I think putting it in context of, understanding the extent of how big your business is, right? Like there's an acknowledgement that a school is bigger than a school, right? There's a lot more around it. Um, and that's uh, that's an acknowledgement I think everyone can understand. And by saying, hey, we need our perimeter to be more secure, um, people will respond well to that knowledge. That definitely makes sense. So, um, so again, just kind of those big, key takeaways starting starting now is is or yesterday is probably the most important thing um, and even if you do have to keep track of it on a on a spreadsheet that's better than uh, better than nothing at this point 
um, making sure you're being conscientious of what kind of information you're sharing um, about your organization and, and even the, the types of, um, types of uh, software and, and hardware that you may have. Sounds like that's another key takeaway. Um, and just taking that extra conscientious thought to make sure even physical assets, us as people, um, that we know who's, who's got what and, and are they supposed to have that and are they supposed to be um, where they are? And so those are, those are my kind of big key takeaways. Sean, do you want to summarize with anything else before we get ready to close out? Yeah, and it was a point I made kind of halfway through how the, the physical world and the cybersecurity world are actually kind of one. Um, from an asset inventory perspective, we think so much about uh, a threat actor being far away and reaching into our computer. Um, but I think we need to reevaluate that. There are also people with a physical presence. And from an asset inventory, they're trying to get access to those assets, whether it's you leaving your keyboard unlocked when you go to lunch or leaving a door you know, latched open and not locking it. That is a way for people to come in and steal secrets, hack things, break things, vandalize things. And those two worlds are starting to come together and it's really being shown from an asset inventory perspective. No, thank you. And I think, I think again, that Oldsmar, Florida um, is, is one of those critical examples because there was a physical on-site um, reviewing of, of, the, of the facility itself that was then coupled with that, that cyber, um, cyber attack. And, and, and honestly, I, I think none of us want to be that test case for anybody else. We don't want to be that, um, that, that potential open door to, um, to, to harming others. So, um, so I think that's a really, really great point. Um, there was one real quick question. Um, so any considerations with regards to how to properly limit Open Records Act requirements for government agencies, how to share required documents without providing hacker-friendly materials within the law? Super great question. That's a really good question. I, I'm afraid that's, that's on the edge of my knowledge base. Um, Open Records Acts are um, complicated rules to get around, and I don't think I've got a real solid um, impression on how to get that done. So yeah, sorry, I don't have a great answer on that one. It's it's a, a place where I think a lot of this SBOM piece is really going to have to mature itself and understand what its limits are and how it interfaces with Open Records Acts and Patriot Acts and crazy um, regulations. And that rubber, I think, has yet to really meet the road yet. Yeah, and that is a really good question. And and um, I'd be happy to follow up I because it, as you're as I'm reading it, it's jogging a, a memory of um, of some, some information that I, I remember getting exposed to around that topic. Um, so I'll be happy to follow up with you on that, um, David, for that question, um, because I do think there is some level of protection that can be provided if there's a concern that by providing that information, there would be, um, you'd be exposing your organization to harm. So um, I'll go back and see if I can find that and get that out to you, um, but a really, really great question. Um, another question real quick too was, I heard that insider threats are growing, especially in state and local governments. Yes. Um, any special advice there in the context of asset management? Great question again. Great question. Yeah. Um, and actually we've got a whole division side of Optiv that's directly tied to insider threat. And it's actually titled that. Um, in most cases, the biggest threat actor you face is your internal employee. Um, I think one of the things that really limits insider threat is the whole idea of least privilege. Um, you can imagine the, you know, the, the law clerk. Does he need access to the back end database of all cases going on? However, the lawyer, the legal system manages that database. No, probably needs access to the accounts he's working on. And the more you can shrink that world for him, the less access he has to do something really dumb. Um, whether he's disgruntled and does it or does it accidentally, doesn't really matter. Insider threat doesn't take into account intent, um, which is an important designation. Sometimes it's accidental. So that's a, a big aspect, the, ac the, the principle of least privilege. The second piece is really being intelligent around your termination protocols. Um, which identity is probably one of the hardest things we do inside of cybersecurity. You guys see it in your banking every day. You've got, you know, when I go pay my bills now, I'm getting hundreds of requests and text messages and emails and forgetting passwords and all those crazy things. That's true in organizations as well. 
your access to Oracle, your access to AWS, like your Google account, all those things are hard to control. Having very solid profiles and policies on what happens when an employee leaves, when a contractor leaves, and what assets do they turn back and what credentials are cut off. Um, you know, everyone's got that, you, you know, your mom's, I, my mom twice in this, um, your mom's Netflix password, right? That's not really something we can keep doing for important things in state agencies. Yeah, and the, the only thing I would add to that too is, um, and this is something that we had talked about on a very, very separate um, webinar conversation, but when it comes to the cybersecurity awareness training, one of the key things too is making sure in your organization that you have a good way for people to report sus suspicious behavior, and then it can be followed up on. Um, because that's one of the biggest things that, you know, it is um, the whole see, say, see something, say something. Um, so if, if you, if you as, a, as an employee start to see some, some little bit of suspicious behavior, um, making sure that ahead of time you've got in your organization a way for those people to, to, to discuss what they've seen, um, share what they've seen and a way to follow up with that. That's also a critical part of it. Part of it because we all have to be we all have to be a team in this. Um, it is a team sport, and um, and so that was just one of the other things that wanted to plug with that piece. Um, all right, I think those are that's it for the questions today. Um, Sean, again, thank you so very much for your time today. That was fantastic. Really appreciate it. Um, we'll be following up with everybody with, um, with uh, an outline of some of the key things, the key takeaways. And, um, and we just want to thank Optiv again for caring about, um, caring about Colorado, caring about our region, um, caring about uh, making sure that we're getting the resources and the talent and the expertise. Um, and we're getting the best of the best. So thank you so very, very much. And I hope everyone has a safe and warmer, warmer day and a warmer end to the week than when we started. So, um, so again, thank you all so much for attending and uh, happy Thursday.